Hello shiny happy people, welcome to Thumb Together TV, and today we're going to be talking about Westworld Season 2, Episode 3, Together. Hold on to your butts. Ba -da -ba -ba -da -ba -ba. Hi guys, I'm Andrew Fantasia. Thank you so much for watching. As always, if you enjoy this video, feel free to give it a thumbs up and give some love to that subscribe button as well. What are we talking about today? Well, we're talking about the Westworld episode that aired last night. It is episode three of the second season. It's called Virtu e Fortuna. You know, my Latin languages are a little bit rusty, but I'm pretty sure that means virtue and luck. Now, what that has to do with the episode, I'm actually not 100% sure yet. I haven't pieced that together in my brain, but maybe during the course of this episode, something will pop up. But speaking of popping up, let's start right with the beginning of this episode because something, you know what? Something popped up. When I was reviewing the season premiere, and we saw that Bengal tiger. I said in my video for episode one, maybe the park that it comes from is like a safari world, or maybe it's themed around India during the time of the British Raj. And guess what? We saw that park today. We saw Park 6. We do know it for a fact because Stubbs called it Park 6. This is it. And it is, in fact, themed after India during the time of the British Raj. Everybody's got pith helmets. They're riding on elephants. And if you noticed, somebody is playing a really cool sitar version of Seven Nation Army. It, it's, it's in the background and it's very subtle. And these two characters you've never seen before are having a conversation. So, you know, the music is quiet. But if you listen carefully, you hear Seven Nation Army being played. Wow. <laughs> That's all I can say is wow. So we meet these guests. Uh, there, And one of them is played by Katia Herbers. And she's kind of the main character in this set of things and they're like hey let's let's hook up because you're hot and I'm hot and that's kind of a cool thing that I've always wondered about Westworld and we never really see it happen is you know what if a, a guest in Westworld bumps into another guest and they're like hey neat park huh want to go around back and you know do things to each other and that never really happened we only ever saw people having sex with the robots but in this case you know th that is exactly what goes down you've got two guests to the park and they're just walking around and enjoying the park and they see each other and they're like, what's up? You're fine. Hey, you're fine too. But first, the woman is, uh, Katia Herbers' character is not entirely convinced that the man is real because he is very physically fit. And she's like, ah, you look like you're synthetic, sir. So she has guns and she picks one up and she says, well, here's a way we can solve this. I'm going to shoot you now. And if you're a human, you know, it's just going to sting a little bit. But if you are a host, I'll have killed you and I'll know for sure. And he's like, oh, okay. And she shoots him and he's like, ah, that really hurts. But I'm human. I told you. Let's bang now. And they have sex. That was like a cool little insight into her character. I understand why they gave that to us. Because her character sticks around. She goes on into, you know, the jungle to go on some storyline adventure with this guy. And apparently this is happening as... Dolores' revolution happens. This tells us, this gives us some, some insight that we didn't know before, is that the revolution is sort of being streamed to all the hosts. It's not just secluded to this one park. Uh, because this random host in this India world, you know, he just kind of stops what he's doing and he's like, these violent delights are violent ends. I'm going to start shooting you now. So it's like, whoa, okay. Somehow what Dolores has done is transferring throughout all the parks. How that happened, I don't know, maybe we've seen? I'm not a computer guy. I don't really, know. when people start saying, I'm gonna hack this and I'm gonna reroute the power, I'm like, I zone out. Like, I trust you, you're typing on a keyboard and something is gonna happen as a result of that. So I don't know if this has been brought up before where somebody said, I'm gonna do this so that my point of view is transmitted to all the other robots. The only thing I can think of is maybe Robert Ford did something like that. Like, the minute he dies, the robots are programmed to go haywire, but then he died at night. And this happened during the day. So I don't know. I really don't know. But needless to say, the hosts in Raj World, or whatever it's called, are not having it either. And they start shooting and they kill that man. But Katya Herbers gets away and she's running through the jungle and she's like, Ah, what do I do? This is just like that movie, but a theme park gone wrong. Jurassic Park 3. She gets to the edge of the jungle and out comes this Bengal tiger. And he's like, rah, rah. he chases after her and she goes beyond the borders of the park. And that's a cool thing that we've not seen either is we see the borders of a park and there's like a little laser fence there. And she emerges from the jungle out into the familiar looking Mesa. And there's a voice saying like, please turn back. You have left the park. Please turn back. And she's like, no, I'm not going to be doing that. 
and she goes right to the edge of the lake and she shoots the tiger and they fall together into the lake and boom, cut to the opening credits. Oh, I... <laughs> I don't know if we're going to see more of Raj World or what have you, but I really hope we do. We're definitely going to see more of that woman, though, because the episode ends with her washing up on the beach in Westworld, and she is found by the Ghost Nation. Now, the Ghost Nation are this whole other matter, and we'll get to that in a minute. Now, we get one little scene in this episode that takes place in that three weeks in the future time period where, supposedly, according to theory that I buy into, uh, that's Teddy and Bernard's body. But regardless, we get one scene there where Bernard and uh, the rest of the security crew, like Stubbs and what have you, reunite with Charlotte. And Charlotte's like, oh, Bernard, you made it out okay. How about that? And she seems pleased with herself about something. She seems kind of smug. At first, I was like, why is she so happy? Like, we're still in the middle of a full-blown catastrophe, Charlotte. Your job is probably in jeopardy. But then I remembered that she had one job, and that was to get Abernathy to the higher-ups at Delos. And throughout the course of the episode, that happens. But again, we don't want to jump ahead. We flash back again to where we left off with Bernard and Charlotte, and they come back out of that bunker, and they're they're walking towards their destination because they're looking for Abernathy and they find him and he is with a group of other humans and they're being held hostage by, I can't remember his name in the show, but Stephen Ogg from Grand Theft Auto V. He's holding them hostage with his posse. This guy's hilarious, man. He he is, uh, like for, for my lost fans out there, Stephen Ogg's character is like the Frogert of this show. Like he just keeps popping up. He always gets killed or maimed or something. And again, here he is, and he's got his posse, and they're holding these people hostage, and he's like, ooh, I'm gonna have my way with this pretty lady, and then I'm gonna do this, and drink, and debauchery, and yay. And then Charlotte and Bernard, you know, trick him, and they reprogram him to be a complete gentleman. <laughs> and they send him back into the camp, and we get that great moment where we see this guy saunter back in, and he's like, how dare you touch a lady in this manner. ba 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 and he takes out all his own men, Charlotte and Bernard, grab Abernathy and they're like come with us please but then there's more trouble there's more trouble in these here parts because the confederados come riding in and they're like hey Stephen Ogg where's those slaves you promised me and he's like I don't want to slave anybody anymore I'm so kind and gentle now <laughs> so they get really pissed off but they see our trio of main characters running off for the hills Charlotte gets away because she's being shot at she jumps on a horse and she she books it. She's out of there. But Bernard and Abernathy get captured by the Confederados. So it's out of the frying pan into the fire in this case. Then we got a couple of really great moments with Maeve's group. They're still making their way towards where Maeve's daughter is supposed to be. Through this journey, they start crossing a river and they turn around and they realize they're surrounded by the ghost nation. As usual, they're just being their normal creepy selves and just staring and moving slowly and getting their bows and arrows ready. And it's like, whoa, guys, we're just passing through. Let it, you know, let us pass in peace. And Hector communicates with them. They talk back and, and they say, okay, you guys are free to pass through the land, but we want him. And they point at Sizemore. Maeve is like, no, I need him. He's my guide. So they have to say no to the Ghost Nation. And the Ghost Nation doesn't take no very well. And they advance to attack. And then something really interesting happens. <clears throat> Maeve steps forward and, you know, holds out a hand and is like, you will turn around and you will forget you ever saw us here. She basically Jedi mind tricks them. Uh, because Maeve has given herself admin access over all the hosts. This has worked in the past. You know, I worked with that cannibal who was going to eat Sizemore. She was like, no, nope, stop. And he stopped. So she does the same to the Ghost Nation, except they don't listen to her. They keep advancing. So she's like, Hector, hold them off. We gotta run. And they start running. And they find an elevator and they go back down into the tunnels and they're they're winding through the tunnels for a long time. And we learn a little bit about Sizemore through all of this. That Maeve chats with him a bit and she, you know, gets to know what he's like. And it's what we figured. He's, you know, this very sad, bitter individual. They turn a corner at one point and they meet up with Armistice. Felix and Sylvester, who are all still alive. Armistice has, like, I think the skin from her hand is missing now, because she's got, like, her hand is fully robotic now. Sylvester has been holding a live grenade under his chin because everybody likes to beat down on Sylvester because he's such a jackass. And they join the group. But as cool as it is to see those three still kicking, uh, my mind kept going back to the Ghost Nation because that is a big red flag. That's a big question that I think deserves to be looked at. Why can't Maeve mind trick the Ghost Nation? Why, why does her admin not work on them? Uh, is it a language thing? Because it shouldn't be. Because Ford and the other park people would not have to speak an indigenous language to the ghost nation they would just be like hey cease all motor functions and that would normally do the trick my guess 
if I had to guess, is that they have something to do with the door. The quest that William was on, and we don't see him in this episode, by the way. But William's quest to find the door, I have a feeling it has ties to the Ghost Nation. Ford would have put some kind of plan in place... Where once the game started for the door, Ghost Nation doesn't respond to commands anymore. So that William can't just walk into their camp and be like, cease all motor functions and then just automatically win. Like, so that there's a challenge there. That's the only thing I can think of. Because otherwise, why would they not listen? So Bernard and Abernathy end up being taken to the Confederado camp where, surprise, Dolores, Teddy, and Angela happen to be. And Dolores is just preparing for war She's got the Confederados, you know, in her pocket now. And she's like, okay, here's what we're going to do. You're going to listen to me. You're not going to listen to your chief anymore. Uh, to to win the chief's favor, she gives him one of the Westworld security soldiers' guns. Uh, and the guns that the soldiers use are, have always been like this. But every time I see one of those guns on the show, it always reminds me of the RCP-90 from GoldenEye. Uh, I don't know if you guys remember that, but it is exactly the same look. I couldn't find, like, a picture of the ones in the show, but the ones in the show even have that, like, reddish-orange stripe on it, like the one in GoldenEye. Every time they're fighting, I just want to pick up an N64 controller and join the fun. But the fact that Bernard is now with Teddy and Dolores, you know, Teddy and Bernard are in the same spot, so it strengthens the idea that, you know, some brain switching and body switching might be happening here. Uh, But what ends up happening at that fort, at that Confederado fort, is nothing short of all-out war and this is the first big battle that we've seen on the show between the hosts and the humans and it does not turn out well for the humans sort of they storm the fort and the confederados attack them and there's a big war and you know bodies are falling on both sides but Dolores has placed explosives next to this flagpole and once the humans get nice and close Angela takes the explosives out and Almost all the humans are wiped out. But in a twist there, Dolores actually locks the door of the fort and doesn't allow the Confederados to come back in. So she's wiping out their army and the human army. She's still got her, like, creepy Wyatt army where everybody's wearing, like, animal skins over their faces and stuff like that. Almost every human who charged the fortress is dead. But in the midst of that chaos, Charlotte, who met up with some of the soldiers when she was running away... She comes in there and she swoops in and she grabs Abernathy and she's like, I got him. And they zip away in a buggy. So she's got him. That's why she looks so smug in the future, I'm I'm thinking. That's what she needs to get the rescue planes to come is she's got to send Abernathy to Delos. And poor Abernathy, by the way, he is just malfunctioning like there's no tomorrow. And I'm assuming it's because of the lobotomy that he has had. He's malfunctioning really badly and he can't remember what storyline he's in. And Dolores asks Bernard to help fix him, but... He can't really fix him here because the damage is very severe. Speaking of lobotomies, though, another member of Dolores' posse is none other than Clementine. And we all remember last season, Clementine got the big old lobotomy, like, right away. Uh, So she's not talking anymore. She's just kind of like a zombie now with a gun in her hand. And she's following Dolores' orders to a T. I don't know if it's just me, but every time I look at Clementine, I feel like she looks exactly like the lingerie sales girl from Christmas Vacation. I don't know. Does anybody else see that? Maybe I'm just nuts. But... Poor Abernathy, he's not in the best health, and then at the end of it all, he gets taken away by Charlotte. And Dolores does not take that sitting down. And we get another just great example of just how friggin' terrifying this new Dolores can be. Where she walks right out of the fortress, and the soldiers are firing at her. They've got these RCP-90s, and she's just got her, her little revolver there. And she walks out of the fortress, and she just starts, you know firing at them to get her dad back. Shots are fired at her, and they hit her. And she just keeps, she does not break her stride once she's getting shot and she's like and she keeps going boom, and she keeps going again Dolores is a badass in this episode she is so great but she doesn't get to the buggy in time and Charlotte gets away with Abernathy and Dolores is wounded and she's all bleeding and Teddy's like oh god now what do we do and she tells the armies what to do but she says Teddy you and I are going to Sweetwater because there's something there that we need and that's the last we see of them this episode now what is in Sweetwater what does Dolores need there. Honestly, the only thing I can think of that could be of use in Sweetwater is the train. Because we never really see it anywhere else. The train we know goes into the human world. So maybe she wants to hijack that. Maybe we're going to see some like great train robbery kind of thing going on, but then she's going to use that to get back into the human world. I don't know. Because she already knows where the elevators are to get to the human world. So uh, that's the only thing I can think of in terms of Sweetwater. And then like I said, we see Katya Herbers get picked up by the Ghost Nation and that's like story for another day because we don't know what's going to happen with her then we get our final scene and Maeve's group has emerged from the tunnels into a forest and there's snow softly falling snow going through this forest and I'm like snow 
I haven't seen snow before. And as I'm saying this, you know, the characters are all like, oh, we're freezing. Maeve says, where are we? And Sizemore tells her, we must be in the north edge of the park in the Klondike area, a part of the Klondike story. And I'm like, okay, so there's a Klondike part of Westworld. All right. And they take a few more steps through this forest. And I notice that the trees look suspiciously like cherry blossom trees. But I'm not, you know, I'm not jumping into conclusions and I stop and I keep waiting. Then I hear the soundtrack kick in. And it's very faint, but I hear a soundtrack and I'm like, that does not sound like the normal soundtrack. It sounds like a flute. That sounds like an Asian flute. And I'm like, oh my God, have we arrived? Are we here? And as they, they make their way into the forest, they see a campfire. They go towards the campfire. I can't remember if it's Felix or Sizemore, but one of them sees something in the snow and starts digging. And they lift it out and it's a severed head. But the head is wearing a samurai helmet. And he freaks the F out and he runs toward the group and he says Maeve we need to leave right now do you understand me like right now and she shuts him up she's like leave me alone I'm doing I'm trying to figure out where we are and they get to the campfire and they hear a noise and they turn around and somebody some dark shape wearing a gi carrying a katana comes charging at them (laughs) boom cut to black ladies and gentlemen We have officially arrived in Shogun World. If I take away anything from this, there's like, there's so much excitement to take away from the fact that we've seen Shogun World for the first time. But if I take away one thing from this, it's a question. It's another question. Felix, I believe, who is the one who found the head, panics as soon as he sees the head. Maeve has admin access. Felix knows this. He does not know about the Ghost Nation incident. So he doesn't know that her admin doesn't work on them. But he knows that she is very powerful and that basically all the hosts do what she says. So why is he so afraid when he finds out that they are in Shogun World? Why does he tell Maeve they have to leave? If the hosts in Shogun World cannot be controlled by Maeve, then what we end up with is we're sort of back at square one where... You've got Westworld hosts and you've got regular humans who are trapped in this world. They're strangers in a strange land and they have to follow the rules. They got to play along because these people are considering them to be trespassing. Whatever characters we end up meeting in Shogun World are not going to be very welcoming. Especially because we saw at the beginning with Raj World that Dolores' revolution has somehow carried on throughout other parks. It's being transmitted, I think. How is her revolution being transmitted? I don't know. But if this is catching on, then it stands to reason that all the hosts in Shogun World are going to do harm to anyone who comes in their way. Now, we saw some really cool stuff in the trailers where Maeve is full on with a samurai sword, and I can't wait to see that, because that is going to be dope. But now we have to wait a whole other week to see what Shogun World has to offer. But that's my biggest concern is, did the revolution carry over to Shogun World? Because whether it did or didn't could mean the difference between life or death for Maeve's group. That's it. Now we have to wait a whole other week to see some Shogun action all up in here and hopefully some more Raj action because that that park was pretty damn cool too. And Katya Herber's What's her deal? She's sticking around. So what's going to happen there? But that has been Thumb Together TV. I'm Andrew Fantasia. Thank you so much for watching, everybody. I'll see you next week right here to cover the next episode. Until then, these violent delights have violent ends. (laughs) 